One Saturday morning, I was taking a prominent businessman from the Akron down to Columbus to watch the Ohio State game. He had his girlfriend and her son with him. And I won't tell the gentleman's name, well, he's long gone anyway, but the company's still here. So we're flying along. Before the trip happened, I had a brand new Piper Navajo, twin engine Navajo, and my co pilot was a neighbor that had flown with me quite a bit, but he never operated the door on this particular new airplane. So before the passengers showed up, I had him, I checked him out on the door. I said, okay, open, close, open, close, open, close, because that's the co-pilot's job to close the door while I'm up front starting the engines, and then when we land, it's his job to go back and open the door. So you want somebody who knows the co-pilot to know how to operate that particular door. So when he said, I said, okay, I think you've got it. So he said, he said, boy, that was a real workout. So he sat back on the seat right opposite the door. He sat on the donuts, the donuts that I buy every trip I have. I get coffee and donuts for the passengers. And he said, oh, my, I'll go get some more right away. He got panic in. And I said, oh, no, our passengers are coming in right now. Don't worry. I've flown this guy for four or five years. He's never asked for donuts or coffee, not one time. He said, we're safe. We take off, we climb up, level off at 4,500 feet, and this gentleman yells, hey, Ernie, where's the coffee and donuts? And I thought my coat pile was going to have a heart attack. And I said, back on the back seat. Okay. And then he says, hey, look at these. These are the biggest donuts I've ever seen. They were big as pancakes. And he says, wow, where'd you get these donuts? He says, well, they look good. So they all had a donut. And they all say, these are the best donuts we've ever had. <laughs> Next trip, I want you to bring those donuts. <laughs> okay. So meantime, my co-pilot was slipping, sitting there, scooting down in the seat, sweating. We land at Columbus. They get out. We go into the terminal building. And the... Uh, passenger calls me over and he told me that uh, when they're coming back and he says that we'll fly next Wednesday I'll have a trip for you Wednesday and I'll call you about it. I said okay so I went back to the club I said what did he say what did he say? Well he told me that he loved those donuts so much that we're going to fly again on Wednesday and I want you to come in early and sit on the donuts. <laughs> That's a true story folks. So from that point on, my co-pilot would always look for donuts and never make sure they were never on a seat. Oh, thanks for listening to that one. Another true story from Whiskey Strip. How's that? One morning, I'd just come back from a trip, and I parked my new Navajo out in front of the terminal building and had it gassed up in case another trip came in. I was in my office, and some commotion was happening out in the terminal lounge. I went out there and looked, it was Mr. John S. Knight, the chairman of the board of the Knight Newspapers, a real big shot here and around the country. A very nice man, I'd met him before, he knew enough, a great guy. He says, hi Ernie, and I was flattered he remembered my name. And I says, where are you going, Mr. Knight? He says, we're heading down to Louisville to the Kentucky Derby. And he says, my girlfriend's coming in in her airplane. And uh, I said, what kind is it? Oh, it's a DC-3, a big, used to be a big airliner. And, oh, really? And so then I heard people yelling out at the, uh, outside at the fence. They said he's on fire. And I went out there and looked, and sure enough, on the downwind leg, which is this way to the runway. You come in this way, but then you land that way. On that leg, the left engine was on fire. And so the crew from the city wheeled a big fire extinguisher out there and waited. And that fire extinguisher on the airplane that the pilot pulled on the engine shut the fire out. And while they're taxiing back, Mr. Knight, I said, Mr. Knight, I have an airplane ready to gas if you want to continue your trip. And he put his arm around my shoulder and says, you know, Ernie, I admire your aggressiveness in trying to get new business. But he said, would you mind if we put the fire out first? I said, oh, no, go ahead, put the fire out. <laughs> so, 
we both got a big laugh out of that one. That's another story that uh, is going to be in the book. So remember, folks, you want to buy that book, $4.95. It's coming out soon. Uh, as soon as I can get Emily to get it out of the computer, get it to the publisher, and it'll be out. This one, that one would be called Whiskey Strip. And there may be another one, too, because we may have too many stories for this Whiskey Strip. But the other one is called The Judas Goat. Now, the name Judas is well known, biblical name. And where did the name The Judas Goat came from? Well, the, in Chicago, in the uh, slaughter yard, the stockyards with the slaughterhouses, the cattle would go down to shoot, and they were always led by a goat. A cattle would follow a leader down the chute, so they called that goat the Judas Goat because he was leading all the cattle to slaughter. Then when they got down to the end, a door would open and the goat would run out. And then it was curtains for the cattle. So during World War II, that's a, that's a real shift the route going from Chicago to World War II, the 8th Air Force. In England, there are B-17s, B-24s, B-26s, B-25, thousands of bombers, plus the British airplanes. And when they're mounting a big raid, they were just airplanes, in fact, a lot of collisions uh, because of this. And the big thing was that in flying over Germany, you had to fly in formation, from what I always heard and was trained. I, of course, I was never in that, I was in the South Pacific. But when you're in formation, you have tremendous firepower to direct against the enemy fighters. So each formation had to be formed, each squadron, each group. But they were milling around trying to find their leader. So they're wasting a lot of fuel and a lot of time. And then the German radar, even though they're primitive radars, would pick up all these airplanes milling around trying to find the leader. So one guy came up with a great idea. He said, let's take an airplane that's war-weary. We'll paint it up in bright colors. Each group will paint it, an airplane in their own colors, very bright colors. That airplane would take off first. So as these squadrons and groups took off, they would form up on their beautifully painted airplane. So then he would lead them toward the target. They'd be formed up, and they'd do it in fraction of the time it used to take. So they saved a lot of time, money, and everything else, and possible collisions. So the pilots, in grim humor, named that lead airplane that was painted in rainbow colors the Judas Goat. <laughs> He's leading them to slaughter. <laughs> Another great story from World War II. Thanks again for listening.